Where the Atlantic Ocean meets the North American coast, sea becomes gulf, estuary, then river, as it winds its way like an artery to the heart of the continent. It's called the St. Lawrence River. People of the First Nations called it the road that walks. It remains an important route inland. Along its shores, around its islands, thousands of lives are played out. Wherever their journey began, they've ended up here, on the life-giving St. Lawrence. The people who live here call it the sea, and claim it's made of the same water that flows in their veins. It's been so since their early ancestors set out to fish. They fell in love with the area, their destinies becoming one with the fate of the sea. As the seasons pass, the St. Lawrence changes character, adopting new masks, yet always hiding from sight the beauty and wealth that lie deep within its waters. Cross to the other side of the mirror, and there can be found a diversity of fabulous creatures, mollusks, crustaceans, fish, and mammals, species which have existed for thousands of years, in colors as harmonious as the landscapes of fall. With the arrival of spring and the gradual departure of the ice sheets, the St. Lawrence experiences an explosion of animal and vegetable life, microscopic beings which in turn provide food for vast numbers of fish. Now the great cetaceans return to the St. Lawrence. Some 10 species flock to the Gulf. These nomads have come to build up their energy reserves. At the heart of this explosion of life is krill. These tiny shrimp-like creatures swim in dense clouds. They're an excellent source of food for numerous aquatic species all along the food chain. Krill is particularly appreciated by the largest animal that ever lived. most awesome creature on Earth. Nearly 30 meters long and a hundred tons of power and grace. The blue whale feeds almost exclusively on krill. In a single day, it can swallow up to four tons of these crustaceans, each only a few centimeters long. It feeds by filtering food and water across baleen plates. This feeding technique is common to all rorquals, members of the family known as baleen whales, or mysticetes. One of the first whales to return in spring is the minke. It uses its speed to drive schools of small fish like capelin or smelt to the surface. Baleen plates are filtration organs located in the upper jaw. They let water through, but trap food inside the mouth. The humpback whale demonstrates great skill in capturing schools of fish. Rockwalls have a series of grooves running from throat to belly, which expand to ingest huge quantities of water and food. The water is expelled through the baleen plates, and the rockwall need only swallow its prey before returning to the chase.
The finback whale makes good use of the riches of the St. Lawrence. Despite its size, 18 meters long and up to 50 tons, this graceful animal can often be seen lunging, open-mouthed, on schools of krill or small fish. To better understand the whales of the St. Lawrence, we must study their prey. On board the oceanographic vessel, the Parizeau, researchers from Fisheries and Oceans Canada use sonars that send sound waves through the water to locate schools of crustaceans and fish. The researchers use sampling nets to determine the type and number of organisms in the schools they have detected. They can then evaluate and map the whale's food sources. By learning the whereabouts of various species of prey, researchers can better understand the movements of the finback whales in the St. Lawrence. Krill accumulates in certain sectors of the ocean trench of the Laurentian Shield, leading its predators to gather in the same area. The finback whale takes advantage of this abundance of krill and small fish to build up its energy stores. The finback must swallow nearly a ton of food a day. This means its most pressing summertime activity is the search for food. Meals eaten at the surface may look spectacular, but most feeding is normally done underwater, where these large animals spend over 80% of their time. What exactly do these whales do under the surface of the sea? For the answer, scientists must journey to the other side of the mirror.
A radio transmitter is attached by a suction cup to the animal's back, so researchers can monitor its activities. The transmitter tracks the animal's movements and informs the biologists of the depth and duration of submersions. After a while, the unit will fall off without harming the animal. The return of whales in summer corresponds to the start of the tourist season in Quebec's coastal villages. In recent years, the whale watching industry has grown tremendously. But how do these excursions affect the whales? While it's difficult to measure the impact of this industry, we must ensure that all activity is carried out with the utmost respect for animal life. Newly acquired knowledge will serve to better supervise the activities of the whale watch industry within the perimeter of the Saguenay St. Lawrence Marine Park. The goal of Quebec's first marine park, which covers approximately 1,200 square kilometers, is to protect, preserve, and promote this unique aquatic territory. Because a high number of whales frequent this marine park, a team of park wardens and fisheries agents conduct regular surveillance missions within its perimeter. This is to ensure that whale watchers respect the laws, regulations, and code of ethics that control how whales are approached. On the other side of the mirror, far beneath the surface, lies another world, a little-known secret world, where the mysteries of life remain impenetrable. To learn more about this vibrant underwater world, marine park scientists are striving to record all the flora and fauna that line the rocky seabed. On the underwater littoral near the shoreline, park divers are making a meticulous inventory of all forms of life within certain pre-selected sampling zones. This information will be combined with data on depth, temperature, and seabed relief. Researchers will then be able to prepare topographical maps and observe the changing underwater landscapes. This knowledge will form the core of resource management strategies and make it possible to adopt habitat protection and conservation measures 
covering the area's entire biodiversity from microscopic algae to the largest of the giants. When Richard Sears, a pioneer in research on the St. Lawrence whales, arrived in the Mingan Islands in 1979, he set himself a challenge to photograph and identify each and every blue whale in the St. Lawrence. The skin of a blue whale is a mosaic of shapes and colors. By examining photographs of the whale's flank and back, biologists can now recognize individuals. Each blue whale has its own unique coloring and skin pattern that can be used to identify the animal. Recognizing individuals is an essential part of any study of behavior. To date, nearly 300 blue whales in the St. Lawrence have been photo-identified. Once a whale has been identified, further information can be obtained. Scientists can trace the family tree of known individuals and classify their genetic heredity. Using a crossbow equipped with a hollow dart, the scientist will take a superficial biopsy, which does not harm the animal. Skin cells will be analyzed to determine the whale's gender and certain genes. A fat sample will be screened for the toxic substances that accumulate in the whale's body over the course of its life. The blue whale is a nomadic animal. Despite sustained efforts by biologists, the migratory roots of the largest animal on Earth remain a secret. Found in almost all the world's oceans, its whereabouts were once well known to hunters. But since the whale hunt was banned in the mid-60s, sightings have become increasingly rare. Although the St. Lawrence is one of the best spots in the world for sighting blue whales, no one knows exactly where they go when they leave the area. Of all the large whales that frequent the St. Lawrence, only the humpback whale has a known migratory destination. Biologists discovered where the humpback whales wintered by locating individuals, ones they had previously identified by the markings on the underside of the tail. Every year, Silver Bank becomes home to several thousand humpback whales known to come from the Northwest Atlantic. In the Northeast Pacific, most humpback whales converge on the Hawaiian Islands in winter. The warm southern waters where humpbacks spend the winter offer little in the way of food. The whales will need most of the energy reserves stored in their fat to survive and to perpetuate the species. The song 
of the humpback whale is the longest and most complex in all the animal kingdom. This mysterious entrancing song seems to form the basis of the male's courtship strategy. Acoustic studies have shed light on the structure of the male's song, but as yet, no one knows its exact significance. follows the laws of natural selection. For males caught up in this ferocious competition, demonstrations of strength and power appear to play an important role in the choice of partners. engage in great battles to determine who gets the females. The ultimate goal of these confrontations, to get as close as possible to the female and drive out all the other males trying to occupy the same position. victorious from these often violent confrontations. He becomes the female's escort, but is soon replaced. The study of reproductive behavior must first focus on what can be observed on the surface. Scientists photo-identified the humpback whales in this study group. Now they can recognize these animals underwater by comparing the skin patterns on their tails. The warm, crystalline waters of the south provide a rare opportunity for study, a glimpse at the hidden universe of the last giants on Earth.
By entering the humpback whale's underwater environment, scientists were able to observe its great aquatic ballet. This gracious dance, thought to be aimed at a female, contrasts with the male's violent preparatory battles. Some biologists believe the display is a show of mutual consent, a sort of prelude to reproduction. But this hasn't been proven, and the mystery remains. As yet, no humpback whales have actually been observed mating. Here, as the male approaches the female, he becomes erect. This rarely seen behavior gives scientists hope that one day they may fully understand the reproductive cycle of the humpback whale. Although no birth has been witnessed in the wintering sites, the young are believed to be born in these waters or nearby. The smallness of some of the young corroborates this hypothesis as the female's gestation period lasts 12 months. After birth, the calf accompanies its mother until it is weaned. During this period, which lasts nearly a year, the calf lives on its mother's milk, rich in protein and fat. When winter ends, the calf will accompany its mother to the cool, rich waters of the north, where she will build up her energy reserves. Winter on the St. Lawrence means ice, numerous ice sheets in constant movement. This would appear to be a major obstacle to marine mammals like whales, which must surface to breathe. But blue whales have been spotted more frequently in recent winters. They have been observed working their way to the surface to breathe in the natural openings that form between ice sheets. These recent observations contradict the assumption that all large whales leave the St. Lawrence in winter. Are these whales late leavers or simply exceptions to the rule? How do they navigate in the pack ice to locate pools of open water where they can breathe? A glimpse through the mirror and it closes again. The blue whale plunges into the depths of the St. Lawrence, carrying with it many mysteries still confronting scientists. Spring. Warmer temperatures free the St. Lawrence from its blanket of ice. Fishermen hear the call of the sea. The sea is bountiful, generous. Many species, like capelin, begin to spawn, a sure sign of spring to residents of the area. The play of currents and tides stirs up the water column, bringing nutritious elements to the surface. In the light of the spring sun, microscopic algae experience a growth surge known as a phytoplanktonic bloom. This provides food for small organisms, which in turn feed all levels of the food chain. The law of natural selection means that only the strongest survive, 
In nature, the death of some has always meant life for others. But can we speak of natural harmony and balance when humankind has often used its knowledge to undermine the laws of nature? Once, the sea's bountiful resources were thought to be inexhaustible, but no longer. When riches are shared between species, competition is necessarily present, and competition inevitably brings victims. Okay, and when did you find it? Dr. John Lian of Memorial University in Newfoundland is well aware of the impact of competition for the sea's precious resources. Since 1979, he and his crew have retrieved more than a thousand whales trapped in fishing nets in the Newfoundland region alone. There's a, there's a red boy up here. They set up a rescue center that functions in collaboration with fishermen's associations. Concerted efforts are essential because reaction time is critical to the success of the operation. This humpback whale was lucky. Freed from the nets, it now returns to the pursuit of prey, small fish also prized by humans. The common porpoise, the smallest of the St. Lawrence whales, often gets trapped in fishing nets. It's not strong enough to swim to the surface and can easily drown. Despite the rescue team's efforts, fishing nets kill whales every year. The Canadian moratorium on ground fishing has considerably diminished the number of nets. But for the whales of the Newfoundland region, it's probably only a short reprieve. The St. Lawrence is also a major seaway used by ships from around the world. But maritime traffic is dangerous to fellow travelers on the route from the Atlantic Ocean to major North American urban centers. Death has many disguises lack of concern, negligence, or thoughtlessness. Or it may have natural origins. Besides man, there is another predator to be feared. The killer whale. Despite its speed, the minke whale is a common target for killer whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Killer whales usually attack in packs, circling their prey before launching the final assault. 
The fatal blow is usually delivered to the throat in the area of the throat grooves. Soft and flexible, they offer little resistance and the prey is easily immobilized. flesh into strips with its strong teeth and swallows it without chewing. Killer whales are the natural predators of whales, seals, and some fish, and may even attack marine birds. Like all predators, killer whales play an important role in the food pyramid and the balance between species. The beluga, like the killer whale, belongs to the family of odontocetes, or toothed whales. It holds its prey in its canine-shaped teeth, then gulps them down one by one. Odontocetes use ultrasonic waves to navigate and locate prey. This process, called echolocation, works like sonar. The melon, a mass of fibrous fatty tissue on top of the skull, contracts to focus sounds produced in the nasal passages. These sound waves are reflected back to the whale. By analyzing the returning waves, the whale can form a mental image of what's ahead, even in opaque water or total darkness. The beluga is the only species of whale that resides year-round in the St. Lawrence. Isolated from populations in the north and the Arctic, these belugas have been part of the St. Lawrence marine environment for thousands of years. But their future is at risk. Hunting, though now prohibited, contributed to the decline of the population and deterioration of its habitat threatens its recovery. Analyses conducted by Dr. Pierre Bellon and his team during autopsies of beached belugas reveal abnormally high levels of contaminants and unusual pathologies. Many contaminants dumped in the St. Lawrence are non-biodegradable, so they accumulate exponentially at each level of the food pyramid. The beluga, feeding at an upper level, ingests and accumulates high concentrations of toxic substances from its prey. This has jeopardized its chances of recovery. Two recent rescue attempts revealed the presence of contaminants in newborn belugas. Each young calf was found near shore, alone, abandoned by a mother, herself probably in difficulty or already dead. One calf was taken to the Quebec Aquarium, the other to Montreal's Biodome. Neither survived. In each case, a malformation of the respiratory system was found to be the cause of death. The calves were premature and, in their natural environment, would no doubt have died.
The autopsies also revealed high concentrations of toxic substances in these newborn belugas. This confirms the hypothesis that contaminants are passed from mother to offspring before birth. The state of health of the St. Lawrence belugas is cause for concern. Biologist Robert Michaud heads a major study that aims to shed light on the beluga's social structure in order to better understand its needs. The beluga's uniform coloring makes it difficult to identify individual animals, as is done with rorquals. Nonetheless, the research team has identified nearly a quarter of the St. Lawrence belugas by photographing distinctive marks, malformations, and scars. Belugas are social animals. Robert Michaud suspects they form clans and long-lasting associations. He takes biopsies to find out how close the relationships are between known individuals. Genes extracted from these samples are analyzed to ascertain the beluga's gender and family tree. These biopsies can also measure toxic substances and their accumulation over time in known individuals. Armed with the results of these studies, scientists expect they will soon know more about the problems that impede the recovery of the St. Lawrence beluga. But the solution, that of environmental problems in general, is in the hands of each and every one of us. We must learn to share the environment and make choices that respect all forms of life. The St. Lawrence is also home to other species of toothed whales, like the white-sided dolphin and the white-beaked dolphin. They are physiologically similar to other species of dolphin that reside further south, but are slightly larger. These white-sided dolphins are great acrobats. Quick and agile, they dash about in pursuit of small fish, which they capture one at a time. The largest member of the toothed whale family is an increasingly regular visitor to the St. Lawrence. The sperm whale. Up to 15 meters long, Weighing as much as 40 tons, the sperm whale is easily recognized by its oblique blow. It feeds mainly on squid, which it can capture at great depths. In the ocean, it can dive to over a thousand meters. Once hunted in all the world's oceans, it has been protected by international agreement since 1986. For the right whale, the Bay of Fundy is a kind of refuge. Formerly one of the most common species of the Northwest Atlantic, the right whale is now very rarely seen in the St. Lawrence. This docile species was easy prey for whalers. Excessive hunting brought its population to the brink of extinction.
Whaling is the cause of the dramatic decline suffered by most cetacean species. Once, whales were hunted the world over. They were considered to be little more than a resource to exploit, a mass of flesh to be consumed, a mountain of fat to be melted for its precious oil. Today, some populations appear able to recover from this bloody past, but others, like the right whale, whose numbers were reduced to a handful, may never recover from the excesses of yesteryear. Today, a few hundred individuals form the entire population of right whales in the North Atlantic. On this particular day, some were observed in reproductive behavior, offering a glimmer of hope for their survival. But scientists are not easily given to optimism. The genetic diversity of the surviving individuals may not be sufficient to save the species. Although protected since 1937, the North Atlantic right whale has shown no signs of recovery. To this day, it's in imminent danger of extinction. Nonetheless, relations between people and whales have changed. For more and more of us, whales are a reminder that our society is poised at the threshold of profound change. Over the years, encounters with whales have given rise to an unusual relationship. A few precious moments with representatives of the animal world, like this humpback whale named Nocturne, and we are reminded of the great challenges confronting us in environmental protection and conservation. Science can provide leads to the environmental issues of tomorrow, but the whole of society must work to preserve this heritage for future generations. The first step is to learn to live in harmony with nature. Beyond research, beyond science, these are living beings who ask only for a place in the environment they share with us. Is it not time to give life, in all its diversity, the respect it deserves?